Hello, my name is John Martin. I'm Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine, and I'm introducing a Professor of Law, just to show you that we're very versatile here in, in UCL. Uh, Joanne Scott joined UCL in 2005 from Cambridge, and since then she's had, according to her CV that I've seen this morning, a stellar career in law, with most of her research being on the global reach of European Union law, and indeed that's what she's going to talk about today. Joanne. Thanks very much for coming. It's nice of people to give up a lunchtime to come and hear a talk on something that they don't normally listen to, although there are a few of my students here for whom this will be uh, an early revision lecture. So this is your opportunity to ask the question that you thought was too stupid to ask in class, okay? This is a chance. I don't regard you as one of my students, even those who are here. So I'm going to talk about a research project, the Global Reach of EU Law, that I started quite a few years ago um, when I was awarded a fellowship by the Leverhulme Trust to conduct the research. As with most research projects, it should be finished by now. In fact, it should be long finished by now, but it's not. But in a way, with this one, uh, history has slightly caught up with the project. So when I started the project, it was really pretty much inconceivable that what I was looking into was going to have implications for the UK. This was about the impact of the EU in what we call in EU law third countries, countries that are outside of the European Union. But of course, surprises aside, it's highly likely that the United Kingdom will be a third country, a non-EU member state within two years. So suddenly my project on the global reach of EU law has very direct implications also for the United Kingdom. I should say the other thing that's happened since I started the project is that President Trump was elected and for reasons that I will explain, I think the project is also timely now in the light of his uh, election to the White House. So the starting point for the project was the adoption by the European Union. Some of you will have read about the directive in the newspapers because it hit the headlines of the Financial Times at the time it was adopted. The EU took a decision to include international aviation in its greenhouse gas emissions trading scheme a scheme that was adopted to tackle the problem of climate change. And it decided to include in that um, regulation all flights landing within the EU or taking off from the EU. And it decided to include all of the greenhouse gases emitted during the entire course of those flights. So on a flight from San Francisco to London, only 9% of the greenhouse gas emissions would occur within the territory of the EU. The other 89% of the emissions would occur in the United States, in Canada, over the high seas, which don't belong to any country. So the directive had a global reach. It extended beyond the boundaries of the EU by including greenhouse gas emissions that occur outside of the territory of the EU. And for those of you who remember it, you may also remember that the world went completely berserk. Everybody went completely crazy with the EU for adopting this measure. Litigation was brought in the High Court in England and Wales, challenging the legality of the directive. The United States, under our very moderate past President Obama, adopted uh, a so-called blocking statute. That is to say, the United States passed a piece of legislation that conferred power on the United States Secretary of State for Transportation to prohibit US airlines from complying with the EU law. So EU law would require the airlines to comply when they landed at the EU airport. US law would make it unlawful for the airlines to comply. So the airlines were uh, liable to face conflicting legal demands. It was widely reported. I have no way of verifying whether it was in fact true, but it was widely reported at the time that the Chinese government was so incensed by what the EU had done that it, um, it announced that Chinese airlines would no longer by Air, Airbus planes. They would prefer Boeing aircraft in the future. The EU 
surprised, I think, actually, by the international reaction caused by its measure, decided to stop the clock, stop the clock. That is to say, the EU tried to back down gracefully. It said, OK, everybody's so cross with us, I'll tell you what. We'll suspend the application of the measure as far as international flights are concerned to give the international organization which is responsible for regulating aviation, it's the International Civil Aviation Organization based in Montreal, ICAO, to give the international organization time to adopt a global scheme to limit the climate change impact of aviation. And everybody will know that aviation emissions are very rapidly rising and aviation will uh, end up being a very large share of greenhouse gas emissions unless steps are taken. The international organization in question had been very slow in reacting to the problem. So the EU said, OK, we'll stop the clock. We will disapply our measure to give you, ICAO, time to adopt your own measures. And we'll give you until the end of 2016 to do so. If at the end of 2016 you haven't adopted adequate measures, we will reinstate the EU directive. Now, obviously, we're past the end of 2016, so later in the lecture, I'll kind of bring us up to date in relation to what's happened with that example. But that example and the reaction to that example, I'm particularly interested in climate change, led me to ask a series of broader uh, research questions. How common is it for the EU to extend the global reach of its laws, regulating conduct outside of the EU? What principal legal techniques does the EU rely on to do so? And then lastly, ought the EU to extend the global reach of its laws? Ought the EU tr to try to influence conduct beyond its borders? And the last question is one where I still haven't reached a very firm position, so that's something that people can probably help me in relation to. The EU relies upon two principal techniques to extend the global reach of its laws. I'm going to spend most time talking about the second, but the first is that the EU increasingly relies on what I've called here novel jurisdictional triggers. Normally, to justify the application of a law to particular conduct, you will use a conventional or an established jurisdictional trigger. The most obvious and the most normal jurisdictional trigger would be conduct. The fact that certain conduct takes place within a state gives that state jurisdiction over the matter in question. Nationality is also a very common trigger. It's very common for states to regulate the behavior of their nationals, both individuals and, and firms, companies which are nationals, even when those companies are engaged in conduct abroad. So those are conventional triggers. The EU has started, however, to rely upon novel triggers. And I'll just give a couple of examples. The first is, EU effects. The EU has started sometimes to justify the application of its laws to conduct that takes place outside the EU on the basis that the conduct has or threatens to have significant and direct effects within the territory of the EU. Now, this arose principally as a result of the financial crisis in 2008, where the EU, for example, wanted to regulate financial activities outside the EU, where it considered that those financial activities, such as derivatives trading, for example, threatened the financial stability, threatened financial stability within the EU. So this use, this recourse to effect as a jurisdictional trigger was very much tied to the global risk presented by 
uh, financial activities. Likewise, the EU has started to rely upon non-evasion as a jurisdictional trigger. We're going to apply EU law to conduct outside of the EU insofar as the person or the company engaged in that conduct is deemed to have taken deliberate steps to evade the application of EU law. If the jurisdictional trigger that would normally be, be relied upon doesn't apply, but the EU thinks that you've behaved in a sneaky way to evade the application of EU law, then the EU legislation will be deemed anyway to apply. And that's an attempt to prevent companies from engaging in regulatory arbitrage, trying to kind of get around legislation by finding all sorts of clever schemes. So tax is the obvious area where a non-evasion trigger um, applies. But the other thing that the EU does, the other technique that the EU re uh, relies upon to extend the global reach of EU law is what I've called in the second row there, territorial extension. The EU uses the existence of a territorial connection to gain leverage, to gain, to gain regulatory leverage over conduct that takes place outside of the EU. Now, the aviation directive that I referred to is an example of this. The only reason the EU is asserting jurisdiction is because the aircraft is in the territory of the EU. The aircraft has landed at an EU airport. So it's the existence of a territorial connection that gives the EU jurisdiction. But having established jurisdiction, the EU says, oh, and by the way, we're going to regulate conduct that occurred outside of the EU. We wouldn't apply our laws to you if you didn't land at an EU airport, but having landed at an EU airport, we're going to tell you that your activities are subject to EU law on a worldwide basis. And this practice of territorial extension is extremely widespread in EU law. Extremely widespread. I could give you hundreds of examples of this. But let me just start with a very simple example and then give you a couple of extra examples that are kind of variations on a theme. A very simple example would be this one. An EU regulation that makes the import of animal products uh, as food, so the import of meat, into the EU conditional upon the meat coming from an animal that has been slaughtered in a way that is consistent with EU law. So if you want to sell beef on the EU market, beef coming from the United States, the, the cattle must have been slaughtered in the United States in a manner that is consistent with EU law. Not because we think how the animal is slaughtered is going to determine whether the beef is healthy to eat. Everybody would accept that we should be allowed to keep beef outside of our market if it poses a health risk. But in this case, because we think that animals should be slaughtered in a humane way. Because we think, as a matter of moral principle, that we should not, as a society, eat beef that comes from cattle which have, cattle which have been cruelly treated. So it's not a product regulation as such. It doesn't relate to the intrinsic quality of the product entering the EU market. It's a production process regulation. It relates to the manner in which the product has been produced. So to check the time. Sometimes 
examples of territorial extension in EU law go further than this example. In this example, the EU law applies to each shipment of beef entering the EU market. You know, an American farmer can slaughter his cattle any way he likes if the beef is going to be sold in the United States. He only has to comply with EU law if he wants to sell the beef in the EU's market. But sometimes the examples go further. In this example, it's an example involving maritime safety and maritime pollution, EU law says, if you want access to our market, and this is a services example, if you want access to our services market to uh, perform services on behalf of EU governments, to certify that ships, are, ships vessels are safe, and not liable to cause too much maritime pollution. If you want access to that lucrative services market, then you have to comply with EU law as a company at all times everywhere in the world. You want access to our market, we're going to tell you what you have to do when you are inspecting a Chinese ship in Hong Kong Harbor. Even if that Chinese ship is not planning to sail anywhere close to the territory of the EU, you want to sell your services in our market, we will seek to regulate your activities on a global basis rather than a territorial basis. And by the way, because companies employ clever lawyers, many of the people sitting in this room will be the clever lawyers employed by companies down the line, don't think that your clever lawyer is going to be able to tell you how to get around this legislation. Because of course, what would a clever lawyer say? A clever lawyer would say, just set up a different company. Just set up a subsidiary, a foreign subsidiary. You know, sell services in the EU market by company X, set up company Y in Hong Kong to service the other, the other global markets. You can't do that because we're going to define organization in a way that applies not just to the parent company, but also to all related branches and subsidiaries. And we're not too fussed about legal form, actually. Also, any other entity which, factually speaking, uh, is under the control of the parent company. We got you. You want access to our market. You, as a company, extremely broadly defined, must comply with our law. How do we verify compliance with our law? When a ship is in Hong Kong Harbor, we say, you want access to our market? You let inspectors from the EU Maritime Agency on board that ship to carry out inspections, to carry out their own inspections, to verify that you are complying with EU law. And if you don't allow those EU inspectors access, you don't get access to sell your services within our market what I've called firm level territorial extension in a snappy phrase. Country level territorial extension. Another maritime example. I'm involved in a project on shipping and climate change at the moment, so I'm full of maritime examples, but I could give you lots and lots of examples from data protection, financial services, any number of areas. Sailors, seafarers, who want to work on board a vessel that is registered in an EU member state, who want to work on board an EU flagged vessel, must be trained in a country that has training facilities in place that have been deemed by the EU to be adequate. 
we don't care, you know, you're a Filip Filipino seafarer, and you say, I have excellent training. My father was a seafarer, my grandfather was a seafarer, they've given me outstanding training. We don't care about your training as an individual. You have to show that you have been trained in a country that meets EU requirements. And if you don't succeed in demonstrating that the system in that country is good enough for the EU, then you cannot enter the EU market. You cannot work in this example as a seafarer on board an EU ship. Now, this applies, as I said, across a wide range of areas. You want to process personal data that has been harvested within the EU, then you have to show that that data will be processed in a country that has adequate data protection laws in place. Google cannot send its data from Ireland, from its servers in Ireland, back to the United States, unless the United States is demonstrated as having adequate, and the EU decides what adequate means, adequate data protection laws in place. Query. There's been a big debacle about this. Finally, it's been sorted out, but with Trump coming into power, saying, for example, that non-permanent residents may lose some of their data protection rights in the United States, will the US system of data protection still be deemed to be adequate for the purpose of EU law? People are already speculating about whether the UK outside of the EU would be deemed to have an adequate data protection system in place. And on the basis of what I've read, the answer is actually it's quite likely that it would not. So if the, e, if the UK wants to be able to process or wants persons within its territory to be able to process data, it's going to have to change its laws to convince the EU that it has an adequate data protection system in place. And that's the case whether the, e, the UK is inside or outside of the EU. The same is true with financial services regulation. In financial services regulation, the key concept is equivalence. You want access to the EU market for financial services. You get access on the basis of showing that your laws and the enforcement of your laws are equivalent to those of the EU. And without an equivalence finding, and it takes years to um, negotiate these equivalence agreements in practice, Without an equivalence finding, your financial services providers will find access to the EU market very difficult to attain. Country level territorial extension. Those who are interested in law, the courts have said this is all fine. The direction of travel in the courts, and by the way, for the law students in the room, don't put it quite like that in an exam. The courts have said this is all fine, okay? We want a bit more analysis than that. But the courts have basically said it's all fine, the WTO courts, the appellate body of the WTO, but also the European Court of Justice has sanctioned as lawful the practice of territorial extension in EU law. The most recent case, very recent case, the cosmetics case, was a case involving the testing of uh, cosmetic ingredients on animals. And the question was, does the regulation, does the EU regulation also apply to animal testing that occurs outside of the EU when the cosmetic ingredients, the cosmetics are being sold in the EU market? And the answer that's given is absolutely yes, because any other answer the court told us would mean that it would be easy for companies to evade the application of EU law by simply conducting their animal testing outside of the territory of the EU. Ought the EU to extend the global reach of its laws? I'll just make two or three points and I'll finish and leave time for questions. I've argued in uh, articles that I've written that we should think about the EU as a 
contingent unilateralist. The EU steps in to address problems where there is a governance def deficit at the international level. It's not that the EU particularly wants to regulate extraterritorially, it's that it's stepping in to address the fact that actually reaching global agreement on any topic is extremely difficult. By stepping in, the EU changes the default position. It says, no global agreement. If there's no global agreement, you comply with our laws. And that creates an incentive for global agreement to be reached. And in a way, the ICAO example, the aviation example, bears this out. Because ICAO did uh, succeed after decades of trying in arriving at global regulations on climate change in October 2016. So the EU, EU contingent unilateralism did push ICAO to act in a way that it had hitherto resisted. But as that example shows, there's then a dilemma. What does the international organization have to do for the EU to say, OK, the global agreement is now good enough? Because what ICAO has agreed globally is extremely weak. It's lacking in ambition in terms of the, 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 the climate change challenge. So the EU is now in the position of having to say, well, ICAO's acted, it's not very good what it's done, but it's good enough, we'll back down. Or actually, what ICAO has done is so absolutely hopeless that it's really just agreement in form. It's not worth having because of the weak substance. And so we're going to, once again, apply EU regulations to international flights. Remember, stop the clock. We're going to stop, stop the clock and bring international flights back into the EU scheme. And this is the debate in the EU at the moment. The European Parliament is currently um, taking the position that the EU should stand firm, and it should once again extend the global reach of its climate change laws because ICAO has not done enough. Related to that, there's a very grave danger that in extending the global reach of its laws, the EU expects other countries to do more than their fair share in meeting the global challenge in question. So in the area of climate change, for example, it's recognized rich countries are more responsible for causing the problem. Rich countries have a greater capacity to address the problem. Therefore, developed countries should take the lead in tackling the problem. There's a danger with unilateralism with territorial extension that the EU or indeed other rich countries might expect poorer countries to assume more than their fair share of addressing the challenge. And I've certainly criticized the EU from that perspective in the past. There's also a question about whether the nature of the objective that the EU pers is pursuing <laughs> matters in terms of the answer that we give to the ought question. Ought the EU to be doing this? You know, sometimes when the EU is pursuing an internal objective, I don't think anybody would suggest it's not appropriate. The EU wants to make sure bombs don't get smuggled on aircrafts in the Yemen because it doesn't want cargo planes exploding in EU airports or falling out of the sky over EU territory. I don't think anybody would say that the EU shouldn't be taking steps to secure aviation security, even if that involves the EU saying, you've got to ensure that bombs don't get smuggled onto planes in other countries. It gets more difficult when the objective is more global, climate change, financial stability. And it gets more difficult yet when the objective is an external objective. Just one example there. We're in the EU not going to sell drugs to the United States that could be used to, uh, uh, I don't know what verb to use, can be used to um, execute people. Thank you. Um, we're not going to allow the export of death penalty drugs to the United States because we in the European Union don't believe that the death penalty should be used. We're not trying to protect our physical security, 
We're trying to protect ourselves perhaps from moral taint, the moral taint that comes with being associated. But in so doing, we're projecting our values uh, into the territory of other countries in a way that is often viewed as inappropriate. The EU would say, you know, our unilateralism, our territorial extension is different from what the United States has done in the past because we would really prefer there to be an international solution. And we tend to engage in this strategy, you know, to pursue the enforcement of international standards or at least to pursue the achievement of an objective climate change mitigation, for example, that has been internationally agreed. But of course, sometimes the areas where you need countries to act in this way are the areas where it is, where it is most difficult to achieve international agreement. And moving forward, if the Trump administration decides it's going to withdraw from the Paris Climate Change Agreement, if the Trump administration decides to withdraw from the United Nations Framework on Climate Change, then a question will arise. Should the European Union include United States products within its domestic climate change laws? So for example, if Trump builds or if the Keystone XL pipeline is built in the United States that will allow for oil from the Canadian oil sands to, be, to enter the territory of the EU, to be exported more easily to the EU, should the EU regulate the life cycle emissions of that dirty oil? So with the election of the Trump administration, I think the appropriateness of territorial extension is going to be tested in a very direct way in the area of climate change. As far as Brexit is concerned, I think the practice is going to become, uh, it might not be called territorial extension, but you will see examples of this in the, in the press in the years to come. I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Professor Scott. What a timely lecture, and how very, very interesting. Could questions be really very short? Could you put your hands up if you have questions? Lady there, no, you, yes. Thank you. It was really, really an interesting lecture. I had a question on the extraterritoriality of EU law in the sense that it seemed to me, according to what you presented it, I'm a lay person on this, so I maybe have misunderstood everything, but um, it seemed to me a different way to impose customs duty in a time of open market, because practically what, you, what the EU law seems to aim at is at being sure that the goods that are traded within the EU have gone uh, the same amount of uh, regulations and control that we are, are kind of obliged to do, and so that it is not because there is some form of exploitation or um, the regulation that those goods are really competitive, but because they're really better or whatever. So it's kind of a way of preventing, of, of ass assuring that free market is really balanced in a good way, as it were. And I wonder which are your thoughts on this? Thank you. So I'll also try to be brief so that other people can answer questions. I, I think the EU, e, EU's motivations are probably dual. I think they're motivated by the objectives that the measure, measures pursue, maritime safety, human rights protection. But I think they're often also motivated by a concern, as you suggest, to ensure that the competitive playing field is leveled, to ensure that producers within the EU are not placed at a competitive disadvantage. And that's one of the reasons why this is so controversial, because of course people say this is just a form of protectionism. You might think it's a good form of protectionism, I might agree, but for many people they say, well, no, developing countries, they, their comparative advantage lies in the fact that their labor costs less, their comparative advantage lies in the fact that individuals within those companies have preferences for lower environmental standards when they compete with other material considerations. So that's exactly one of the reasons why it's viewed as so controversial. Thank you. Um, frequently, 
legislates extraterritorially, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the Foreign Accounts Tax Compliance Act. Um, I'm just wondering if a comparison has been done in terms of, it's too crude perhaps to put percentages, but what part of EU law is applicable extraterritorially compared to, say, the US's? Right. So I haven't seen a, any attempt to kind of quantify, but I've certainly seen comparative studies, as I can send you the link. There's a very good note in the Harvard Law Review, a student note, actually, from a few years ago, uh, which attempts some sort of comparison. One of the very interesting things that's happening is we're seeing a role reversal. The US used to act extraterritorially, and the EU used to go berserk. Now, the EU acts extraterritorially, and the US goes berserk. There are still examples in US law, and you cited two of the good examples, where it continues to act extraterritorially. If anybody's American in the room, they know you know you pay tax on your worldwide income, even if you've never set foot in the United States. But all of the recent judgments coming from the US Supreme Court uh, entrench a presumption against extraterritoriality in US law. In a fascinating recent example called the Nabisco case, it's an action brought by the EU to try to tackle the extraterritorial smuggling activities of a US tobacco giant. And the US Supreme Court decides that that law cannot be enforced uh, extraterritorially at the behest of a private party. And the EU is regarded for this purpose as a private party. That's a long conversation and an interesting conversation. Can I ask a question then? Uh, I'm sure the right wing of the Conservative Party are not concerned about your Filipino sailor being trained properly. They don't care if he falls off the ship as long as the product is cheap. Mm -hmm. That is the rawness of Brexit, isn't it? And coming back to your ought, I like the way you placed law in a moral framework. And isn't that the important message here, that, that Europe is primarily a, has a moral vision of the world and in, is using law to not impose but to extend that moral vision? And for me, that's the great tragedy of Brexit, that we will not be part of, of, of that. No. We, we won't be part of it, but if we want to continue to gain access to those markets, not in an institutionally embedded way through the European economic area, just as a, you know, in a hard Brexit scenario, if we want to continue to get access to it, we are going to have to continue to be driven by that moral vision of the EU much more roundly than people understand. People often, you hear people say, we'll have to comply with product standards. Whew. You're gonna have to do a lot more than comply with product standards because it's not simply that I can give you hundreds of examples that exist now. It's the potential. You know, if this is happening in the areas I'm describing, it can happen in other areas as well. Yeah. And in a post-Brexit world, in a post-Trump world, the European Union will have additional incentives, economic and moral, to externalize the reach of its law. OK, 30 seconds left. Sorry, uh, how do you think a conflicts of law situation would handle that? Because, strictly speaking, the compliance with the EU law in your examples pertains to the designation as providing the service, etc. But if there is another law in place in your Hong Kong example or here in Britain, to what extent would compliance with the designation law be able to be used as a defence to the breach of the alternative law? Because it seems to me that that would certainly however the British courts would handle that, would inhibit the British government from doing any form of regulation that would put them in a problem. Right. So it's a, it's a good question. Um, as things stand, there are sometimes what I've called conflict equivalence clauses included in the EU legislation. So the EU legislation says, if it's impossible because of a genuine conflict to comply, then we grant an exemption. But that's, that's relatively rare. You see that in some areas of financial services regulation. There's a broader question about whether conflict equivalence, which is quite a narrow concept of equivalence, will be deemed to be a principle of EU law. So in one recent case, 
the European Court comes quite close to reading a principle of conflict equivalence into a piece of legislation where it doesn't ex expressly exist. It's a case called the Zuchtvier case. It's an animal transport, animal welfare case. But if there is no conflict equivalence clause or no conflict equivalence clause is read into the legislation, then it becomes a question of politics, actually. It becomes a question of power because the private international law, the conflicts of law framework, won't solve this challenge. So it's not at all inconceivable you end up with genuine conflicts. In the aviation examples, my last word, in the aviation example, it was interesting. When the US passed the blocking statute saying uh, US airlines might be told they shouldn't comply or mustn't comply. Airline aircraft leasing companies started to put a clause in their contract saying you have to comply if you want to lease this aircraft. So the market, to some extent, through contractual relations, will also try to address the risk that that kind of conflict situation presents. But there's a, yeah, again, it raises lots of really interesting questions. Professor Scott, thank you very much indeed. Super.